Blessed day everyone! Today, we will be tackling the medieval period entitled Turquoise and Green Knight. But before we proceed to our lesson, I will present first our objective. Our first objective is to describe English literature during the medieval period. Second, analyze the culture values described in the legend Turquoise and the Green Knight. And lastly, demonstrate awareness on chivalry and being a true gentleman. These are the contents of our discussion for this day. First, you will learn the introduction, summary, and characters of the poem. We will also tackle the five points in the poem. They are Sir Queen and the Green Knight, the Queen's Temptations, Symbolism of the Color Green, the Green Knights display the Christian Gospel, and lastly, Honor and Bravery of Sir Queen. Now, let's move on to the introduction of the poem. Sir Gawain and the Green Knight was written in the 14th century by an anonymous poet who was a contemporary of Geoffrey Chaser. The story was originally written in a northern dialect. It tells the story of Sir Gawain's first adventure as a knight. So this poem is considered as one of the masterpieces of Middle English literature. It is a story of knightly deeds, sexual enticement, and a wild landscapes. It was written in Northwestern England in the late 14th century. So Sir Gawain was written in English, but not the kind of English you'd recognize. It's written in a dialect of Middle English called Northwest Midland. So Middle English was a much less standardized language than the modern English is today. Gawain's belong to a genre of medieval literature known as Romance. So romance texts aren't predominantly concerned with love, but often focus more on adventure. They frequently involve a hero, it is usually a knight involved in a quest. So this poem is part of the medieval romance tradition, which means it focuses on the journey or quest of a single knight and what he learns about himself and his culture in the process of pursuing a great adventure. So the noble Gawains accepts the challenge of a mysterious knight. When we say knight, it is not a black or a dark one. It is a green one. And the story goes from there. So no one knows who wrote Sir Gawain, but it is written in a unique style. So the author responsible for Sir Gawain's distinctive style probably also wrote three other long poems that are contained in the same manuscript. They are the pearl, patience, and cleanness. Unlike Sir Gawain, these other two poems are more obviously religious in nature because he also wrote pearl, though the author is Sir Gawain and the Regin Knight is sometimes also known as the pearl poet. Now, let's move on to the summary of the poem. The story starts when the court of King Arthur is celebrating New Year's Eve. But at the height of the festive, a massive green figure burst in, terrifying them. So this green knight tells the court that he desires their participation in a game, in which he and one of the knight present will trade axe blows. So the chosen knight will take the first strike, and then he must wait a whole year to receive a strike in return for the green knight. So the knights make no answer. But when their visitor mocks them for cowardice, Arthur steps up and offers himself as the contender. Just as the king readies himself to take his strike with the axe, Sir Gwyn stops him and offers himself instead. Gwyn strikes at the calmly standing green knight and cuts the knight's head off. So the court is astonished when the knight picks up his head on the floor and strikes Gwyn to find him at the green chapel before riding away. So at the castle, he is welcomed heartily by its lord, who introduces him to two ladies, his beautiful wife and an old woman. So the lord invites Gawain to play a game. Each day, the lord will go out to hunt while Gawain rests in the court and by the end of the day, they will swap whatever they have won. In short, whatever the lords get will be given to Gawain and whatever Gawain's get in the court, will, it will be given to the Lord. Soon, 
it clears that the prize at court is the host beautiful wife. On the first day, the Lord hunts a deer and the lady gives Kawain one kiss. When the men meet for dinner, the Lord presents Kawain with the meat and befitting the deal, Gawain exchanges it for the kiss he has received. On the second day, the Lord exchanges for a boar for two kisses. On the third day, the Lord kills a fox and the lady kisses Gawain three times. Furthermore, the lady asks for a love token from Gawain. When he claims he has nothing to give, she starts offering him tokens for her own. All the token was refuses from Gawain until she offers him a green girdle, which she explained will protect the wearer from death. Hopeful that the girdle might protect him from the green knight, Gawain accepts. He hides it under his cloth to keep it secret from the Lord. The next day, Gawain anxiously leaves his new friend to go and face the green knight at the green chapel. The Lord sends a servant with him to show him the way and the pair soon arrive at a forest where the servants try to dissuade Gawain from facing the green knight. But Gawain doesn't want to be a coward. He goes on alone. The terrain becomes strange. Tall rocks obscure his view, but eventually he finds a grass-covered cave. He hears the knight sharpening his weapon inside and prefers himself. The knight emerges and makes two false strikes, the first because Gawain flinches from fear and the second to praise him for not flinching. The third strike lands, but it only wounds Gawain. It is then that the green knight reveals that his name is actually Bertilak, that he is the lord of the castle where Gawain has been staying and that he has been testing Gawain. So he explained that he has punished Gawain with this third strike for his dishonesty in hiding the green girdle on the third day of the hunt. An embarrassed Gawain, he put the green girdle on his arm as a sign of his failure, returns to Camelot, where a hero's welcome awaits. So when he confessed his sin, King Arthur admires his humility and orders the court toward symbolic green bands in solidarity. So now, let's move on to the characters. So we have here the characters of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. Our first character is Queen. He is the main character of the story. He is Arthur's nephew and one of his most loyal knights. Although he modestly disclaimed it, Gawain has the reputation of being a great knight and courtly lover. He takes the Green Knight's challenge on behalf of Arthur and Camelot. He prides himself on his observance of the five points of chivalry in every aspect of his life. Gawain is pinnacle of humility, pity, integrity, loyalty, and honesty. His only flaw proves to be that he loves his own life so much that he will lie in order to protect himself. Our next character is the Green Knight. The Green Knight is the wild side of eminently civilized Lord Bertala. So the Green Knight shows himself to be the supernatural being when he picks up his own severed head and rides out of Arthur's court, still speaking. So at the same time, he seems to symbolize the natural world in that he is killed and reborn as part of a cycle. So at the poem's end, we discovered that the Green Knight is also Bertilac, the Wayne's host, and one of Morgan Le Fay's minions. Our third character is Bertilac, the Hood Desert. So Gawain's host at the castle, he mysteriously finds in, on Christmas Eve. He also the Green Knight. So we only learn Bertilac's name at the end of Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So the poem associates Bertilac with the natural world. His beard resembles a beaver, his face a fire, but also with the courtly behavior as an aristocratic host. So boisterous, powerful, brave, and generous. Lord Bertilac provides an interesting foil to King Arthur. So at the end of the poem, we learn that Bertilac and the Green Knight are the same person, 
magically enchanted by Morgan Le Fay. So for her own designs. Yup, you hear me right. So they're the same character. Although we don't find this out for sure until the end of the story, it's kind of like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, except that neither personality is evil. It is a fantastic creature who appears at King Arthur's Christmas feast. He is also Bertilak of Hot Desert. Our next character is the Lady of Hot Desert. He is a name wife of Bertilak of the Lady of the Castle. The extraordinary, beautiful, and charming lady spends three days trying to tempt queens. He is Bertilak's wife, attempts to seduce queen in a daily basis during his stay at the castle. Though the poem presents her to the reader as no more than a beautiful young woman, Bertilak's wife is an amazing, clever debater and unstruth reader of queen's responses as she argues her way through three attempted seductions. So flirtuous and intelligent, Bertilak's wife ultimately turns out to be another pawn in Morgan Le Fay's plot. So our second to the last character is Morgan Le Fay. She is enchantress and resident of Bertilak's court at Hot Desert. She is also Gawain's aunt and Arthur's half-sister. So the Arthurian tradition typically portrays Morgan as powerful sorceress trained by Merlin, as well as the half-sister of King Arthur. Not until the last 100 lines do we discover that the old woman at the castle is Morgan Le Fay, and that she has controlled the poem's entire action from beginning to end. As she often does in Arthurian literature, Morgan appears as an enemy of Camelot one who claims to cause as much trouble for her half-brother and his followers as she can. So our last character is King Arthur. He is legendary king of Britain, founder of the Round Table. He is Gawain's uncle and Morgan's half-brother. So Arthur refusal to eat until he hears a fantastic tale show the petulance of youth, as does Arthur's initial stun response to the Green Knight's challenge. However, like a good king, Arthur soon steps afterward to take on the challenge. So at the end of the story, Arthur joins his nephew in wearing a green girdle in his arm, showing that Gawain's trial has taught him about his own fallibility. Overall, we can see that Sir Gawain is in the center because he is the main character in the poem. In his upper left corner, we have the Green Knight, which is his opponent, on the other hand, in the upper right corner, we have Bertilak the Hot Desert, he is the host, and Bertilak and the Green Knight are the same person. While Lady Bertilak is married to Bertilak the Hot Desert, she still flirts with Sir Gawain. While Morgan Le Fay, she is the mastermind in the poem. She controls everything. She is a half-sister of King Arthur, and King Arthur is the uncle of Sir Queen, that's why Morgan Le Fay becomes anti of Sir Gawain. So this poem, we have five points in explaining the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So let's start with Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So this section, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight pertains to agreement between Bersilak, the hot desert, the host, and Gawain. So Bersilak is to go hunting in the morning while Gawain sleeps. Upon the return of Bersilak from his hunting trip, he is to give the Gawains all that he has caught. In return, Gawains is to return all that he has won in his hunt. They make this bargain three times at the end of each day. The segment begins with Bersilak showing Gawains the fruit of his hunting trip. Gawain returns the fruit of his hand by bestowing on Bersilak a kiss. The resource of the kiss given to Gawain remains anonymous. However, Gawain is not aware that Bersilak knows exactly where and from whom Gawain has received his gift. Sir Gawain and the Green Knights consist of three hands, three temptations, and three different animals. It is not by accident that the first day's hand is for deer. So the deer represents the innocence and purity of Gawain as a knight. The lengthy and detailed description of the hand 
and the capture of the deer serves to emphasize the symbolism of the deer. The even more detailed description of slaughter and butchering of the meat further emphasizes the symbolism. It can be inferred that the butchering of the deer is similar to the fate that awaits Kawin when he meets with the Green Knight. So the next day hand is for a wild boar. So the fierce animal is symbolic of Kawin's reaction to the increasing advances from Bersilak's wife. The boar is fierce and mo much more difficult to catch and kill, just as Gawain is steady in his resistance to temptations. Bersilak is aware that Gawain is resistant to all temptation at this point. Gawain is true to his reputation of chivalrous worthy knight. So the third day's hand is for Willy Whaley. The third day hand is for Wily and Cunning Fast. So this is symbolic of the clever way that Gawain resists temptation. However, Gawain is tricked by Bersilak's wife into taking the green girdle. The acceptance of this skip represents Gawain's fall from perfect chivalry and knighthood since he lies about it to Bersilak. Our next point is Sir Gawain's temptations. So in this poem, Sir Gawain and the Green Knight translated by Moriborov Gawain is a guest of Hot Desert Castle. During his stay at the castle, three separate hands take place. These hands also parallel temptations aimed at Gawain by the wife of the Lord of Hot Desert Castle. In each hand scene, a characteristic of the prey of the hand is personified in Gawain's defense against the advances of the Lord's wife. So the first temptation of Gawain's is perhaps the most difficult for him to defend. This temptation corresponds with the hunt scene involving a deer. So in terms of the hunt, the deer is hunted because it's a staple of diet or it is something that satisfies a person. In the same manner, the Lord's wife views Gawain as art, resembling an animal that she hunts. She pursues him on the sole basis of her carnal desire. This, her first temptation, is utterly sexual. She is viewing Gawain much as a hunter would view a deer. She has no interest in any kind of relationship, and she is not extensively flirting with him as she does in the next two temptations. She simply wants sex from him, plain and simple. She is pursuing Gawain for the sole purpose of making him her trophy. If he falls prey to this temptation, then she has slain him. In his reaction to the lady, Gawain acts much like a deer. The second temptation of Gawain is easier for him to defend against. This temptation corresponds with the hunt scene involving a boar. The wild boar is an aggressive animal wounding many of the host men and dogs before being fatally wounded by a slash across the throat by the host sword. So the host wife in this scene acts more aggressively than she did the first time that she tries to seduce Gawain. She scolds him for not remembering the lesson she taught him about kissing out of courtesy the day before. That's why Gawain defended himself by telling her that he did not want to force a kiss on someone who would reject him. So she becomes more aggressive and invites him to the use of violence, saying that he should force a kiss if any woman were foolish enough to reject his advances. But Gawain rejects her advances and tells her that this is not acceptable behavior and that he can give a kiss if a lady is willing. So we can see in the scene that the Lord's wife again approaches Gawain in the same manner. But this time, Gawain doesn't attempt to avoid the advances made upon him. He decides to be more confrontational and direct with her. Gawain does not physically harm the lady as a boar may. He is much more frontal and direct in his dealings with her. The third temptation Gawain accepts the girdle to save his life, so this temptation corresponds with the hand scene involving a fox. 
So the fox is the most cunning and sly of all the animals so far and takes more measures to catch than any of the animals before it. So the fox relates to the host wife because of the way she uses her own sly techniques to try one final attempt at seducing Gawain. She dresses up in a seductive dress and reveals more than any dress that she wore before while he was visiting the castle. The host wife stops trying to seduce him sexually at this point, but she tries to tempt him three more times, showing that she is crafty in her seduction. Instead of testing him in his loyalty to the host and his knightly honor, she tempts him she tempts him by using his desire to live. First, she asks him for a small token as parting gift to remember him by such as a glove. Then she tries to offer him a ruby ring as something to remember her by. But Gawain rejects both these gifts because he has nothing to offer her. It is that until she offers him a green silk girdle that he thinks about giving her temptations. So Gawain at first refuses the girdle until she says that it is magical and protects the wearer from death, which is something he needs for his challenge with the Green Knight. He readily accepts this gift from the host wife, which shows that while he turned down the offer of love from the lady, he is just caught off the facts in the end because he gave into the temptation. Gawain's giving into his desire to live by accepting the girdle from the host wife shows that he has a human flaw, just as the fox was given the human characteristic of being a thief. Our third point is symbolism of the color green in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, the knight who we later find out is Bertilak takes a liking to the color green. He could have chosen red for the strength and power, or purple for royalty and wealth, but instead, he chose green. So the green knight has tinted green skin and a feature, a green holy branch, a green axe, and a green horse. Green is known to stand for peace, restfulness, harmony, lust, love, fertility, and nature. So in this poem, I found that the relationship between the green knight and the color green is likely correlated with nature and lustfulness. Nature consists of animals, plants, and all things nature made. Nature can be unpredicted and in some cases, hard to control. So during Gawain's quest to find the knight, he is attacked by any different animals and is challenged by the changing landscapes. So even when the green knight is not present, there are still brazil elements of nature threatening Gawain's life. So on the other hand, the Green Knight live in a castle that looked like it had emerged right out of the ground. Inside of his castle, his wife wore a green gown, which symbolizes the lust. Bertilak expects Gawain to feel for his wife. She gives Gawain her green girdle, which is supposed to keep Gawain from harm. He does not give the girdle to Bertilak out of respect for the woman and to protect his life. So Gawain passed the Green Knight's test, but wears the girdle anyway because of the shame he feels for not being virtuous to the Green Knight. So the color green represents the love of life. So in the end, Gawain does not die at the hand of the Green Knight. The chapel that was meant for his death brought a new meaning to the color green, which is life. So Gawain is given a second chance and he wears the green girdle to remind him of the lust and unpredictability of his journey. So green turned out to be the perfect color of this poem. Our fourth point is the green knights display the Christian gospel. So imagine you are surrounded by all your closest friends and relatives sharing the latest gossip, being somewhat happy where you are but constantly struggling with the demand of upholding a respected reputation. Now, imagine that out of nowhere, someone busts through the door to challenge you and turn your life completely upside down. So this is the Gospel of Christ, which is also beautifully displayed through Bertilac or the Green Knight, 
and his relationship with Sir Kuwin. So three specific pieces of this text create parallels between the nature of the Green Knight and the nature of God. First is his appearance in King Arthur's court. So the Green Knight appears in the court leaving the guest speechless, considering only miracles and magic to explain the Green Knight's presence that night. So immediately, the writer makes it clear that this man is wholly set apart from the rest of this court as more powerful, more brilliant, and more worthy of honor. Because the idea of chivalry and reputation was not important during this era, the writer made sure to show that the men in Arthur's court would never compare to the Green Knight even before his instance of immorality. So in the same way, Christianity makes it clear that although we are in the image of God, we are not originally capable to his glory. So our second is his new covenant with Gawain's as Pertila. So the Green Knight had just created a covenant or thought with Gawain's that he knew would be nearly impossible for Gawain's to honor because he knows it leads to death. So although he learned in retrospect, we see another side of the Green Knight through Bertilak and his hospitality. So the Bible is divided into Old and New Testament, with a focus on the covenant of the law in the Old, and a shift in the focus of forgiveness and the covenant of truth in the New. Even while knowing Gawain's cowardice, Bertilak declares, You were worried and worn, holy with hunger, harrowed by tiredness, yet join in my reveling right royally every night. What I win in the woods will be yours, and what you gain while I'm gone, you will give to me. So Gawain no longer has to live up in unrealistic expectations, but simply enjoy the relationship with his new master. Also, by the authoritarian, green knights exist in another form, which is carrying Pertirak. We see a divine collusion of justice and love, like the God and Christ. And lastly, his forgiveness on the following New Year's. So at the end of the tale, if the congruencies with Christianity were not already clear, the writer summarizes the gospel in four lines after the Green Knight spares Gawain's life. The harm which you caused me is wholly healed. By confessing your failing, you are free from fault and have openly paid penance at the point of my axe. I declare your purge as polished as pure as the day you were born, without blemish or blame. So the Green Knight declares Gawain's free from the contract that originally bound the two, and invites him to come back to his home as a friend and an equal, even though he did not pass all of the tests. So two extremely prevalent themes of the Middle English era diverge in Sir Gawain and the Green Knight, which is chivalry and Christianity. So as the hero sets out on his quest, her personal honor, he is tested and found inadequate but completely forgiven and invited to share in the Green Knight glory. But our last point is honor and bravery of Sir Gawain. So during King Arthur's reign of power, a story was told about his nephew, Sir Gawain and a green knight who wanted to fight the bravest of King Arthur's knights. So many themes and symbolics are exemplified throughout this story, including the overall performance of honor that was displayed throughout this time period. So honor is difficult trait to uphold when others often attempt to test their commitment to remaining honorable. Sir Gawain undergoes many obstacles that test his promises and agreements. So the first example of honor and heroism is when Arthur stands up to defend his people and Gawain jump up to protect Arthur. So in this instance, Gawain has no idea what is about to be asked of him. But to protect his uncle, who has provided everything from him, he will do everything, even if it is includes fighting one of the biggest knights around. So another example is when he made the heroic decision 
to make the journey to the green chapel that awaited the green knight. So as he made his way to the chapel, the servant that accompanied him said, Not a soul will know that you fled in fear. So instead of running away from his certain impending death, however, Gawain was willing to risk his life in order to prove he has a honorable knight. So in today's society, it is not a common task to voluntarily walk into a death trap just to prove honor and nobility. So another area that expresses Gawain's chivalry is when Gawain makes the honorable decision to not have an affair with Bertilak's wife, although she toys with him, saying, a knight so courteous and considerable in his service, really out to be eager to offer his pupil some lesson in love? Why are you whom all men honor? However, in the last time, Gawain shows how honorable he is, is actually when he fails to tell the truth by giving the girdle to save his life. So even though Gawain's fail to tell the truth, he says, God bless you for this gift and I shall wear it with good will, but not for its gold, but as a sign of my sin. So this illustrates that he confesses his sins and disappointments himself for not being honorable that he wears the gilder around him arm to symbolize his sin. So with these few mistakes that are common of all women, the deeds and promises that he upheld prove him to be an honorable man. So I hope you learned in our discussion in the medieval period entitled Sir Gawain and the Green Knights. Thank you so much for listening!